41,550 pounds. That is how much it costs to enter Parliament. And you thought the London Eye was expensive. No, seriously. <laughs> Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> um, that is actually the figure that research suggests it costs MP um, to win a seat, and that's out of their own pockets. But before I break down this cost, before I weigh it up against the supposed advantages of being an MP, and before I discuss why it is absurd that anyone would wish to lay out such a sum in order to become one, it's appropriate that I introduce the opposition. I'll begin with future MP Rob Harris. Um, <laughs> Rob famously wore a garish red cummerbund to the recent union ball. Um, in fact, I hear that Anna Wintour visited last term on the condition that she could meet Rob, who, in her words, is world-renowned for his audacious fashion sense. Her words, not mine. Um, and I can only assume that Rob's bold choice of colour is reflective of his political views and that he will be running for a Labour seat in ten years or so. Um, that's very funny, by the way. <laughs> um, uh, next, I move to Dear Chakravarti, who is the political director for the Tax Dodgers Alliance, or Taxpayers Alliance, it depends how you look at it. Um, she doesn't personally dodge tax, nor do her colleagues, I'm sorry about that. Um, <laughs> the Taxpayers Alliance are, you're not going to like this one, um, are a bit like the Tea Party, but without the racism, which is good because they're not racist, but kind of sucks because it's like the Tea Party. Um, <laughs> In addition to her political activity, she, is actually, she makes beautiful Bengali music and I've actually listened to some of it and I'm actually not going to take the mick out of it because I really like it. Um, but, you know, I take it she won't be singing if Rob's party get in this Thursday. And finally, to Baroness Randerson. She has a decorated political career. She was Deputy First Minister for Wales and a Liberal Dem Democrat spokesperson in the National Assembly. And having directed a strategy to promote the teaching and speaking of Welsh um, as Minister for Welsh Language, I will find it nothing less than hypocritical if you don't deliver your entire speech in Welsh. Um, however, I do think there is something appropriate about hypocrisy in this debate, given that it's all about MPs. Um, these are your guests, Madam President, and they are most welcome. Uh, the figure of £41,550 is from research done by Conservative Home. Um, it includes foregone salary and encompasses the costs of becoming a candidate, as well as the costs of a successful election campaign. Before you've even identified which seat you intend to contest, you're out of pocket by about 500 quid. Compulsory formalities such as paying your membership to the candidate association and attending parliamentary assessment boards ensures that this is the case. Next are the costs involved in finding a suitable seat to challenge for. Um, obviously, to pick a seat, you've got to do lots of research, which involves travelling and staying in lots of different locations and paying for research analysts, etc., etc. One MP from 2010 estimates that in the 12 constituencies she researched, she spent £2,000. Again, that's even before the election campaign. And then, of course, there are the costs of the campaign. And I think the most expensive part of this is housing. If you're not already a local candidate, the party that you're running for will expect you to become one. That immediately rules out anyone unable to afford two homes or whose original property is worth significantly less to the sort of housing in the area in which you intend to run. In 2010, one MP, and I quote, saw her mortgage payments double in size and, uh, and the doubling, yeah, her mortgage double and the size of her house halve um, and because she was fighting for a constituency in London's commuter belt. And then there's sort of the everyday costs of, being an M of, of running a campaign, the ones that slowly add up. These range from footing the bill at fundraising dinners, to having volunteers to stay with you, to buying raffle tickets at every NAF event you have to go to. Um, now, in marginal seats, you know, candidates will get a lot of financial support from, from the party. But in safe seats, i.e. most constituencies in the country, uh, candidates will have to foot the bill for most of these things themselves. Um, and one quote, which is you know, really very depressing, um, that I got this week in doing a bit of research, um, was from a Conservative MP um, in, in the Midlands, in Redditch, who's, who said, without a well-earning husband, I couldn't do it. And that, yeah, that's really, really depressing. Um, and the almost farcical point is that MPs are expected to stand in unwinnable constituencies before progressing to safer seats. So the real cost of eventually making it to Parliament can be well above £40,000. 
More, more than this, MPs got to, have got to level this cost with an annual salary of £67,000, which, yes, is well above the national average. Um, but, you know, when you consider the amount you've spent to, you know, become an MP, uh, and then you sort of juxtapose that with the fact that you could even be out of a job in five years, given the sort of precarious nature of elected positions, it's really rather difficult financially. And it suddenly makes a lot of sense why 87% of new MPs had salaries exceeding the London average before entering Parliament. There is quite simply a financial bar on average earners with average assets. This house, first of all, would never be an MP because it's too bloody expensive. And then there's another kind of cost. There's one that's kind of more subjective but equally important, and it's that relating to time. Because if you represent a constituency um, which isn't in London, you're essentially going to have to spend from Monday morning to Thursday evening for half a year away from your family. This is, of course, due to the demands of, of Westminster to be in Parliament, to be voting. And whilst this might suit MPs with, with sort of kids that have left home or kids that haven't been born yet, um, it's very, very difficult for MPs with young children, MPs trying to raise a family. And the fact that the average age in Commons is 50, and the fact that 502 out of 650 MPs are male, I think clearly indicates how family life and parliamentary life are irreconcilable. So, to those of you who still think they like the idea of becoming an MP, you can say farewell to your loved ones, you can cross your fingers that you don't go bankrupt, and you can look forward to lots of letters about wheelie bins. But let's, let's take an individual that fits all the right criteria. They have a high income partner, they have personal assets, their kids have left home, they also haven't been born yet. Um, the question we have to ask is, is it really worth it? Is, it? is it all worth it? Do the perks of the job outweigh the costs necessary to get there? And of course, no is the answer, as I'm going to tell you. Um, aside from the desire to cultivate their metastasizing egos, um, I think the reason that most MPs, sorry, that, that was harsh, it's not really true, um, <laughs> most MPs enter politics to make a difference. I really believe that's true. Um, but I intend to show that becoming an MP is not necessarily the best means of doing this, and that on a broader parliamentary level, MPs are essentially impotent pawns. And when I say pawn, I mean the kind that's in a chess piece as opposed to the kind MPs were claiming on their expenses. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, but I, I don't want to tar all MPs. Many do make a difference, and even for the right reasons. Um, this week I spoke to a member of the House of Lords and an MPs manager as well, and they both told me that for the MPs that they know, um, the most valuable use of their time and what they find most rewarding is casework. Now, casework is sort of Westminster speak for dealing with your constituents and, you know, resolving their problems. And whilst the stereotype is the kind of storm in a teacup style, oh, my neighbour's phallic hedge is blocking the sunlight from my garden, there's, there's actually, you know, a lot of important problems that they address, um, which sort of range from immigration, domestic violence, ad addiction, depress depression. Um, and I'm told that constituents often begin phone calls with, I'm sorry to call you, but there's no one else. Um, and I do believe that MPs make a difference for these people. However, must you have renounced your family life and be capable of sourcing 40 grand in order to help Mrs. Mogg from My Visa Has Run Out Street? Of course not. Um, the Citizens Advice Bureau, for instance, exists in order to help people exactly like Mrs. Mogg. The Citizens Advice Bureau have systems of operations for problems relating to, and I quote from their website, Benefits, work, debt, relationship, housing, discrimination, tax, healthcare, education, the law, the list goes on and on. They offer face-to-face -face, um, advice from over 3,300 locations, meaning that for every room an MP surgery is taking place in, there are five in which the citizens advice services are offer offering comparable services. And alongside the volunteers, there are 6,500 people who are paid to run the service, meaning that statistically you're 10 times more likely to become an employee of the Citizens Advice Bureau than you are to become an MP. But you know what the best part is? The best part is that you can even get one of these jobs if you're not rich. How awesome is that? And if you're really, really lucky, you can even live in the same city as your wife and kids or husband and kids when you're fulfilling these professional duties, helping people. Now, again, I do not want to detract from the important roles MPs play in their constituencies. Rather, I wish to underscore the fact that most of the valuable content of their work abounds elsewhere and in careers that do not require the same sacrifices, both in relation to fi finance and to family. And in other words, there are numerous means of affecting important change that are less exclusive and entail greater personal freedom. And it is also worth noting that there are significant limitations to what MPs can do for their constituents. 
Although MPs are big shots in the constituency, in Westminster they are one amongst a conglomerate of 650 and subordinate to the Cabinet who make all the decisions. Constituents can write to their MPs on matters of global importance, but they can expect in response you know, a message which has been forwarded to staff, which has then been forwarded to the relevant caseworker, which then embodies the party line in the response. And this administrative procedure is suggestive of what limited say MPs have on issues that extend beyond the realms of their constituencies. Whilst MPs are busy trying to make a difference in their constituencies, parliamentary debates are inevitably left empty. And this leads me on to my next point, and my final point really, and that's the fact that the whip system reduces MPs to party delegates, and I'll explain what I mean by that. MPs become nothing more than a vote towards a party objective. They are voting every day on matters on which they are clueless. One day it's fracking, the next day it's zero hours, even in the same afternoon. And of course they have no expertise in any of these areas, or at least they can't have expertise in all of these areas. They must simply obey the commands of the whip. Is there not something quite soul-destroying and profoundly unsatisfying about a job where you are constantly required to make a stand in complete ignorance of what it is you're actually making a stand about? And then there is the more sinister side of the whip system, the threat of being punished for defying party orders, overlooked for promotion, shunted to a windowless office, can't think of anything worse than that, or conversely, the prizes for loyalty, places on select committees, trips abroad, patronage as brazen as it comes. I think I'd pay £40,000 not to be a part of such a system. The sacrifices you make to become an MP are great. The main motivation and benefits of the job, helping people, are achievable elsewhere and at no price. And when it gets to parliamentary duty, the work is profoundly unsatisfying and your presence, were it not synonymous with a vote, is negligible. The cabinet decides, the whips give the orders and the MPs must comply. This house would never become an MP because the benefits, of which there are few, simply do not outweigh the costs, of which there are many. Ladies and gentlemen, I beg you to propose this motion.